At the same time with those trials and tribulations, God always sees them through. Um, we still serve the God that had said in um, Matthew 16, verse number 18, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So obviously then, not even death can prevail against the immortality, cannot prevail against the love, cannot prevail against the resurrection of the body that's to come. When Jesus comes back on that second coming day in which we all look forward to with enthusiasm to be forever with the Lord. As you can see on your screen, as again, we meet virtually for Bible class tonight, uh, we're going to continue the story of the rich young ruler. Um, we're on part three, which my anticipation tonight, if the good Lord sees fit, is that this is going to be the conclusion of this mini series using this young man's life for our inspiration, for our encouragement, and in some cases, our correction. And that's really what we're going to be talking about tonight is more on the application side of this story. In other words, how does it apply to your life? What do you get out of this in your own life? And so that's going to be the challenge for us right now. What I've learned over time and preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ for 20 years pretty much at this time is that with every message from God, there's a same message, same truth, but a different application specifically for each here or there. So what you get out of this is going to be specific to you. What I get out of this is specific to me and for the next person as well. Uh, so as you know, let's go ahead and get into it. But again, we thank God for giving us opportunity to uh, share in this class, to grow, to be in the land of the living, and to be more and more Christ-like with every breath that we take as God would have it to be. Uh, so let's go ahead and get going. Again, we're going to conclude tonight, if the good Lord sees fit, the uh, story of the rich young ruler. But again, not from the academic standpoint. We did that two sessions uh, prior to this. We're going to deal, deal more with the application and how this applies to us personally. All right, so let's go ahead and get going. And we're just scrolling down to where we left off. All right, so now we're in Luke 18, verse 23. Uh, we're in the portion where we're right after Jesus telling the young man, you still lack something. And that was to go and sell what he had and give to the poor and then take up his cross and follow Jesus. Uh, many of us that have been familiar with this story knows the conclusion of it. And unfortunately, we know that this rich young ruler, he walked away from eternal life. In other words, he gave up what, what mattered the most. He gave up the most valuable part of this encounter with Jesus in order to keep the material things that he had in his possession. Of course, we know that um, he was no pauper, as we like to say. He was no poor man. Uh, the Bible says by far that he was rich. He had great possessions. Okay, let's look at this for a minute then. Let's look at that scripture, Luke 18, 23, and see how it how it goes here. Luke 18, 23. And again, my computer wants to give me a little technical issues. Bear with me one minute. I'll get it back on the screen and we'll be fine. I remember it did this last time, so we should have a antidote for that. Bear with me a second. I'll get it back on the screen. All right. Looks like everything's up. All right. So we'll be able to do this now. All right. So Luke 18, 23 again is where we're starting off. And again, we use Matthew's account as well as Mark's account to build the entire truth and not make any mistakes. All right. So as you can see on your screen, then verse 23 uh, is what we're talking about. And this is the rich young ruler after he was told these words that challenged him to be spiritually minded instead of materialistic. Here's his reaction. Verse 23 says, and when he heard this, he was very sorrowful for he was what? He was very rich. All right, so let's jump back into the story again with this one. All right, the rich, young, uh, rich man turned down treasure in heaven 
for the temporal riches of earth. Let's look at that for a minute. Matthew 19, verse 21. Matthew 19, 21. And feel free if you're using your phone for your Bible or if you're, um, you know, paper Bible, feel free to turn with me as well, but I'll have it on the screen. All right, so Matthew 19, verse 21. And I'm using one of my favorite websites, Bible Gateway. I've used it for years. Seems pretty easy and user friendly via the internet. You can get it from, you know, get it anywhere, any device. Okay. Now, remember, here's what Jesus said in response to this man leaving. It said, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're going to study that if we haven't already of why uh, Jesus said that. And figure out what that means to us. Now, remember, on the last occasion, we were talking about it's not necessarily a sin to I have riches is not necessarily a sin to have wealth. It's what you do with it that makes it sinful. Remember, it's the love of money. That's the root of all evil. It didn't say that money itself is evil. Money has a purpose. Money is to always be used to help the poor and uh, to help those in need as well as support one's family. So money in and of itself, the concept is not an evil thing. It's hoarding it. It's, it's making it your God. You know, uh, the King James Version calls it covetousness. Or it calls it actually idolatry. So anytime that, you know, you spend, if you think about it this way, anytime that you spend more money, I mean, more time that is looking at your bank account than your Bible, well, you might be a little covetous. You know, anytime you do more as far as taking care of the physical needs of things more than the spiritual things, there's some things that are incomplete in you and there's some things that are incomplete in me that we have to work out of our spirit because God is always supposed to be number one. Remember Romans 12 verse one again, what did Paul say? He said, I beseech you therefore brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Which is your reasonable service. So again, God first over all other things. So here's where our challenge comes. Now, remember we're talking about the one that has authority over heaven and earth, Matthew 28, uh, verse 18 to 20, and the one that's going to judge all mankind. And that's Second uh, Timothy 4, verse 1 and verse number 2. So we're talking about Jesus specifically. So this is why Jesus was able to look at this man that looked like he was perfect, looked like he was holy in front of mankind. But Jesus, the judge, was able to stare into his heart, if you will, symbolically speaking, to see exactly what was wrong beyond the surface of the man. And that's how he knew he was greedy, knew he was covetous, knew that he was materialistic and challenged him not to be that way. Remember, uh, as we studied on a previous occasion, Jesus looked at this man with love. He wasn't looking at the man with criticism. He was trying to tell him something to answer the question he asked in the first place. Remember, he said, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus was basically telling him, you have to perfect yourself. In other words, you have a flaw in you that will deny you the kingdom. And so that's the thing with us. It's better to be a friend that says something negative in love than it is to condone behavior of others that's detrimental to their spiritual life. And so he's showing us a thing that we're supposed to do ourselves, you know, but again, first look at yourself and then look at others before you have to correct them. Uh, but that's not my message here tonight. The message then becomes, what is lacking in you? What is lacking in me? And I guarantee you, if you came here with an honest heart, there are some things that you and I need to work on. Do I have anybody in that is actually honest listening to me right now? Do you believe that you've been to the mountaintop of perfection? Do you believe that you have done nothing uh, that God could ever hold against you? Do you believe right now that God owes you salvation because you've earned it? Well, that's what the rich young ruler's problem was right now. Everything that was that, that was a part of the Jewish mentality, Jesus was trying to teach them out of, as we covered on last time. They thought they could work their way into heaven. They thought they were so perfect that there was nothing that God could say to them to deny them heaven. And so this is what he was showing them using the rich young ruler as a, 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 
what do you call it here? I'm looking for the word as in a, a living example of the truth that we all need Jesus. We all need him for salvation. We all need our sins washed away in his blood. That's really what he's kind of talking about uh, right now with the rich young ruler. All right. So here's our challenge then. Galatians 5 verse 22 and verse 23 is talking about the fruits of the spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is constantly working upon our hearts to perfect us, to make us more and more like Jesus Christ uh, each day of our lives. And so Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 shows us what should be added to our faith. Now, that's one thing that actually uh, convicts me and conv should convict anybody that's honest. Let's look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23 just for a moment. For those that are not familiar with this passage of scripture, I want to read it verbatim um, out of the King James Version of the Bible. Then we're going to break it down uh, so that we can apply it to our lives. So let's look at Galatians 5, which is the fruits of the Spirit. In other words, this is where God wants us to be. And our heart's desire should always be this. In other words, this is what we're all striving to become. Let's look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. And the Henry Street knows and probably going to be able to complete my sentence before I say it. But when you look at that word spirit, you look at the capital S. In the King James Version, it designates when God is talking about the Holy Spirit. So in this case, but the fruit of the spirit, in other words, that which the Holy Spirit, who is divine, who is God, who is given as a gift in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, after a and is washed in the water grave of baptism, the Holy Spirit is given unto them, uh, that person that is, as a gift of a guide in this life, someone to help that person, right? So that means everybody that's a Christian, that's sincere about it, the Holy Spirit is guiding you. And of course, we know that he, his written word is, is how he does that. So here's what's going on here with this. It says, now go Galatians 5 verse 22, God is saying, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Against such there is no law basically means God has nothing against these characteristics for a Christian to have. But instead, these are the things that he wants condoned growing within all of us so that we become more and more Christ-like each day of our lives. So let's break this down then. Now remember, what you want to do is you want to put yourself in the shoes of the rich young ruler. Now, you may be a pretty nice person. I may be a pretty nice person, just like the rich young ruler is or was, I should say. But at the same time, he was incomplete, as if we're honest with ourselves, we're incomplete in some things. And so the question then becomes, using Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23 as your guide, ask yourself, not your neighbor, just yourself. What would complete you? You know, you may be a pretty good person uh, from a moral standpoint, but what is it that's, that's lacking in you that you have to work on? And that's the challenge that Jesus presents in front of all of us, not just the rich young ruler. So let's look at this for a moment. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 of what God wants. Now, first he said the fruit of the spirit, meaning in other words, what the Holy Spirit produces in your life first is love. And that comes from the Greek word that's very famous in the Bible, uh, of which the Bible was originally translated from the Greek in the New Testament. Uh, it means agape. And of course, uh, Henry Street knows this well, but it means to have a self-sacrificial and unconditional love for anyone else. So my question then becomes a question that God uh, has for all of us then. Are you complete in your love? Are you willing to sacrifice the things that you want for the happiness of others? Are you willing to sacrifice pride? Are you willing to sacrifice anything that can get in, in your, your spiritual way of being a better person? Well, if you're not willing to do that, then there's not love really dwelling in you from a Christian standpoint, not from a biblical standpoint. And so it's just like that rich, rich young ruler, if Jesus was standing in front of us, just using our imagination, we may have gone through the list and say, hey, Jesus, I attend worship service all the time. You know, I, I, I give all the time. I sing praises unto you all the time. 
But he may come back and say to you, come say to me, well, this one thing you're lacking, you're lacking love. You're not a self-sacrificial person. You don't love people unconditionally. You know, if, if somebody wrongs us, can we go back and be friends with them again? Huh? Or do we separate ourselves immediately like water and oil repelling, repelling ourselves from a person that has hurt us? Well, God is saying, basically, if that's the type of person you are, then you are incomplete. There is something in you, your temper, something, your patience, something in you has to give in order for love to come forward in the forefront of your life, in your word, thoughts, and deeds. So who, you know, I'm not asking you to ask your, ask anybody else, but ask yourself, will being a loving person complete me? Well, if the answer is yes, don't hesitate. You know, make that commitment to love and love today because tomorrow's not promised to us. The next one, the fruit of the spirit within us that should be producing is joy. Now, I see this all the time in the world that really, if you think about it, the world doesn't have that joy. I mean, how many people do you know that, that are not Christians, for instance, are always joyful, always happy, can always see the silver lining in a, in a, in a dark cloud, those type of people. You don't see that very often in the world. Most of the time you hear gloom, you hear complaining, um, you hear somebody that always wants to fuss about something. Well, that's the way of the world. And that's the way, if, if we're honest about it, the way I used to be, you know, growing up, uh, so forth and so on. I always saw the negative in everything. I just thank God for my, my father, Alan Ty, uh, Tyrone Norwood, many years ago that really kind of turned me around and tried to get my head right to not always think negative about anything and everybody, because when you do that, you're killing your own joy. Think about it. You're fighting the Holy Spirit that's trying to put a smile on your face, but you're looking for every reason in the world to frown. Hmm? The Holy Spirit is trying to show you what by people all around you that there are some good people around you. But the only thing that you can see are the ones that are thorns in your side. You know, if, if that is the case, you have to realize who's doing that to you. Remember, anything that God wants for you, the enemy, the adversary, Satan, Beelzebub, the dragon, whatever you want to call him, he is always working against your joy. And so you got to realize that and be able to see through the traps that he has in your life. Satan will program you and control you and put you in habitual hopelessness, habitual uh, sadness, habitual depression, because he does not want you to be able to yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life who actually produces joy. So think about that. So my question then becomes, okay, again, if Jesus was standing in front of you once again, and you are the rich young ruler, and your issue may not be materialism, your issue may be, I'm always angry. Well, Jesus will come back and tell you the same thing. He'll tell you in love, this is one thing that you lack. You lack joy. So the question is becomes, can you knock down the wall in your own life? You can do that through prayer. You can do that through resistance of what the devil is always trying to tell you and depress you all the time. You can do that because I hope you're still a Philippians 4 verse 13 Christian where Jesus said, I can do all things. I mean, the Holy Spirit said, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. So again, ask yourself, are you lacking these things? Well, of course. Jesus will come back and tell you, okay, this one thing you're lacking is joy. That's not the life that a, a, a child of God should be living when it comes to depression and anger and all that kind of stuff. That means Satan's really got a hold on the mind when you can't find joy, even in the worst circumstances. Let me move on. Let me move on. Uh, the next thing, ask yourself, are you complete in your peace? Are you complete in your peace? Now, when you look up that word in original Greek language, it is irene. Peace means that the Holy Spirit is trying to build in you a peacemaking mentality. That's what that means. Um, are you always at war with somebody? Do you always have to give them a piece of your mind? Huh? Do you always have to get some revenge over something? You know, then God is basically saying you're, you're not complete. This you have to get out of your spirit. You have to yield again to the influence of the Holy Spirit, 
where you're going to be a peacemaker instead of a peace breaker. So with that being said, then everything that you do, you think about what effect it'll have on other people. You know, that's why you're able to bridle your tongue, hold back some things that you don't need to say at a certain time. Because again, what are you doing? You're robbing uh, the other person of their own peace. When in fact, what did Matthew 5 tell us? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. These are the things, the characteristics uh, that we are to bring to the table. And that's the influence of the Holy Spirit within our lives. So I ask you again, would Jesus say to you, this one thing you're lacking is being a peacemaker? I sure hope not. And I sure hope he wouldn't diagnose me spiritually in that way as well. All right, continue on. Um, notice something again. Now, these things that, that the Holy Spirit is teaching, they're not natural. These aren't things that we're born with. These aren't things that the world imitates. These are things we got to work on and incorporate in our spirit, no matter how much resistance there is out there to the contrary. All right. So again, would Jesus say to you, if you were standing in front of him, this one thing you're lacking is long suffering. Well, long suffering in original Greek basically means patience with others, especially after being mistreated. Now, notice something. The order of the words make a difference. In order to be patient with other people, especially being uh, mistreated by somebody, first you got to be a loving person. And so, obviously, then it's 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 basically something almost like a stair step. You know, once you get love, you can take the next step and be patient with other people. Okay. Hope you see that uh, in the text here. Now, again, patience with others, especially after being mistreated. Think about what Jesus went through. You know, when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, Jesus was able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, think about how profound a statement that is. Could you, after you had been beaten, I'm talking about with the fist of men, it's the smacks of, of people on your face, being spit upon. I'm talking about even before he was crucified, um, being whipped by pilots, uh, 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 soldiers, and then put on the cross of Calvary for hours with nails in your hands and your feet. And you're able to look at a crowd that's making fun of you after all of that and still be able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Well, folks, Jesus would never tell us something that he wouldn't do himself. So it's obvious that in order to follow Christ, we have to be patient. And again, the King James Version calls it long suffering with other people. So again, I challenge you with the question again, if Jesus was standing in front of you, would he say this one thing you're lacking? Is it long suffering, meaning patience with others? If so, ask God to help you right now. And he'll strengthen you in that situation. But you got to yield your attitude to him to say, here I am, Lord, send me on this issue. Uh, the next one, would Jesus, if you're standing in front of you, uh, again, using Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which is the fruit of the spirit um, as our guide, would he say this one thing you're lacking, which is gentleness? Now, in the original Greek language, gentleness means in this case, kindness in terms of being friendly, generous, and considerate for other people. Now, let me ask you this question then, and I don't want you to go back to your home congregation. I know we have people that are here from uh, Henry Street, but we have other congregations represented under the sound of my voice right now, and you're welcome to be here, obviously, there. You're our honored guest. But, you know, over the years, um, over the last 20 or so years, I've moved around for job opportunities, and I've gone to different congregations, eight or nine of them, and they all have a different personality collectively uh, than the next one. Um, but one thing that you're going to find is that that part of a congregation is collectively the result of what individuals do. Hope that makes sense to you. In other words, they should be friendly, they should be generous, and they should be considerate over other people, I mean, for other people, that is. And so then the question becomes then, are you a kind person? Or are you the type of person that's so unfriendly that when service is over, you don't stay behind and talk to anybody? You're quick to the parking lot to get out of there so you don't have to socialize with anybody? 
Well, then God is saying you don't have the gentleness, which means friendliness, gener generosity and consideration that you should have. And so, again, is this, this a challenge to you that Jesus would stand in front of you and tell you, you know, in the Greek, original Greek language, uh, this one thing you lack? You may be be faithful to worship service, but you won't associate with anybody. So how are you being friendly? So that you need to incorporate into your own spirit. And, you know, all of us that are struggling with that. The next thing that he talks about then in Galatians 5, uh, verse uh, number 22 and 23 is goodness. So goodness basically is self-explanatory. It means that the Holy Spirit in your life is constantly building upright character within your heart and your lifestyle. So again, are you yielding to the things that would make you righteous? Uh, or would Jesus stand in front of you and say, you know, to you, this one thing you're lacking is goodness in your spirit. So keep that in mind. And, you know, that's one of the things that you have to submit to for yourself in order to uh, do that. Yes, ask God to help you with it, but there's still a portion in which that's our personal responsibility uh, as well. Moving on as we continue on. Now, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 uh, also tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is faith. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is not faith in the terms of just believing in God. You already had that by the time that you get to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Otherwise, you could not be saved. So God is not talking about faith as in believing in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. He's talking about faithfulness. He means loyalty to God. So in other words, the more and more you experience God, the more and more that you're praying, the more and more you, you're dedicating your mind to God, the more and more you're studying, the more and more close and intimate relationship you have with God, and you, you're, you're showing him that you're more and more trustworthy the more and more that you live. So man and God can depend upon your word. As we like to say, our word is bond at that point. Our word is gold because now we can be trusted. So the question then becomes then, are you self-centered to the point that you can't be trusted by God or any man? Um, are you to the point that, you know, as mentioned earlier, you don't really have love. Remember, love is the spark plug for all of this love for God and man. The more and more you love God, the more and more loyal you'll be unto him. Uh, moving on again, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, again, in original Greek language, meekness. It means to be gentle as an easygoing nature about yourself. Now, ask yourself this. And I, and I know that we all come from different backgrounds. And a lot of times our background has made us something it should not have. In other words, we all carry around some baggage. You know, a lot of times it's emotional baggage that kind of makes us, uh, in lack of a better word, grouchy towards others. Um Impatient again uh, towards others, um, quick tempered, you know, quick to lose our temper at any moment. And I know that 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 comes from being hurt. But one thing you have to tell yourself, not everybody has hurt you. And so you don't have to always be quick tempered, sharp tongue with everybody else, because there are some people that have been hurt just like you. And of course, you can relate to each other. Instead of starting World War III over every little thing that somebody does, if that is the case, that things always get under your skin, you're so irritated so quickly that you're always snapping, wouldn't Jesus come back to tell you, as again, we use our symbolism teaching right now, that this one thing you're lacking, you're lacking meekness. You don't have that gentle, easygoing nature where it's hard to rile you up. Now, of course, we know that uh, anger in and of itself is not a sin. It's, it's basically holding on to it or being quick tempered that becomes a sin. Okay. So in other words, it, it must take a little bit, it must take some things, a lot of things going on in order to rile you up. Otherwise you're gentle, you're easy going with everybody else. That's something that the Holy Spirit is actually building upon and within your character, if you're allowing it to happen, as we talked about a little bit earlier. And of course, the last thing is temperance. Temperance is, is basically an overall way of conducting yourself, 
over your sinful passions. In other words, sin doesn't always rule the day with you. Hmm? I know we make mistakes, but our mistakes should not be a way of life. And so God is saying that the Holy Spirit over time, and the more and more you yield to him, the stronger and stronger you become. I like to say it to all the time to the home congregation, Henry Street, that good habits are as easy to make and maintain as bad habits are. Hmm? Because we are creatures of habit. And so the more and more that we engage in, in good and proper resistance to temptation and just good behavior, period, the easier it becomes to be that because it becomes a way of life unto you. Okay. All right. Hope that makes sense to you um, as we continue to go along. So again, ask yourself, what would complete you? And that's basically what Jesus was doing with the uh, rich young ruler, except his fight may not be your fight. My fight may not be your fight. But I guarantee you, with all of these characteristics just came out of Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, we're all caught up in at least one of those nets where we need to become complete in these things. Commit to that today. And you'll see a difference in your life. You'll see that you'll improve over our time. Now, let's move on then. Uh, going back to Luke 18, verse 24 and verse number 25, as we uh, get back into the story of the rich young ruler. Let's look at that. Luke 18, 24 and 25 to refresh our memory about what was going on with the encounter of Jesus and the rich young ruler. All right. So again, we're back in the story. It says, and when Jesus saw that he was sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. All right, let's go back into our presentation after reading that scripture. All right. So what did Jesus mean if we have already established that is the love of money and not money itself that is a sin? Well, again, the answer is in Mark 10, verse 24 and 25, in which Jesus said, those that trust in money cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, again, as we talked about before, you always have to study every version of the story because if you leave out one detail, you run to the wrong conclusion. Thus, it is impossible. I won't stay here long because we talked about this over the two sessions before. Thus, it's impossible for those who trust in money to go to heaven as it is for an animal the size of a camel to literally thread through the eye of a needle. Commentators don't like that, but what other conclusion can you come to? Then Jesus is talking about literally a camel going through the eye of a needle. He's saying it's impossible for somebody that trust in their own money to make it into heaven. Because basically what people end up saying when they're filthy rich, as we like to say, and they have no love for God, they'll quickly tell you they don't need God. They'll quickly tell you that Christians are weak and things of that nature. I've gone through it, you know, personally on these issues, but they're going to be uh, uh, surprised on the judgment day. Because again, like Job told us, naked he came into the world. Naked he's going to return. Your money cannot save you. It can't buy you heaven, can't buy you salvation. You can't bribe your way into the pearly gates and walk down the streets of gold because there's no currency that can redeem a man's soul except for the blood of Jesus Christ himself. Again, that's how John 14 verse number six comes into play. Like Jesus has said, it doesn't matter how much money you have. He didn't bring economics into the picture. He said in John 14, verse number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So again, he's the only way we can make it unto heaven. Let's continue on uh, so we don't let time get away from us here. Now, again, we looked at Luke 18, verse 26 in the past, and we're finding out that the crowd itself was looking at the rich young ruler as somebody they held in high esteem, okay? So he obviously would have had a good reputation among the people. So again, this leads us to the conclusion that is that there were people in the crowd comparing themselves against his, his lifestyle. Now, what God tells us, don't ever compare yourself against another Christian. 
because you cannot compare the imperfect with the imperfect and create perfection. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. You see, again, you can't compare your life to mine. I can't compare my life to yours because at the end of the day, we're going to stand in front of Jesus as individuals. And again, I like to use this, this illustration. If you remember the old days in school, you have to realize that Christians are not graded on the curve. I don't know if you remember that old grading system where there would be uh, some A's given in the class, you know, excellence, and there would be some F's given in the class for failures. And as long as you were somewhere decent in the middle of the pack, you pay, you actually passed the class. Well, it don't work like that. In reality, it doesn't work like that spiritually because that basically is, is a way of comparing people to people. But God doesn't compare people to people like that. He compares us to Jesus, if you really want to know. All right, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12 for a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. He's trying to keep us out of spiritual arrogance as the church in this. And this is Paul speaking to the church of Christ that met at, met at Corinth in modern day Greece. That's 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Let's get that for a minute. Again, you can you can um, turn along with me or use a screen, whatever the case may be. All right, computers bringing it up via the internet. Bear with me a second. Second Corinthians ten verse twelve. Here's what he says. And this is the Holy Spirit through Paul, God's word, saying, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. And he's talking to the Christian community here. He's saying Christians should not compare each other to each other. You're not wise in doing so because, again, you cannot compare imperfection to imperfection and gain perfection. It just doesn't work that way. The problem is if you're better than me, you know, in your own eyes, you can still be sinful in God's eyes and vice versa. Because again, what are we talking about? Remember, what did Jesus do with the rich young ruler? He didn't tell everybody in the crowd, this you're lacking. Go and sell your goods and give to the poor. No, he told that rich young ruler that specifically to sell his things and give to the poor because he was testing the man to see whether or not he was going to continue in his materialism. All right. So again, you're going to be judged in an individual and we want to shore up our own weaknesses, uh, you know, compared against the standard of Christ. And anytime we compare ourselves to the standard of Christ, we already know that we're not perfection because the Bible only talks about Jesus being perfection not any man on earth, not Moses, not Joshua, not Ezekiel, not anybody you can think of. The only human being that he testifies as literally perfect that ever lived was Jesus himself. Remember, he was the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so with the lamb, just like the Old Testament, you could not give any flawed lambs to God. You had to give the best. And God himself gave Jesus the best, the perfect one for our salvation. Let's go to Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. I won't spend much time here because uh, Henry Street is very, very familiar with this passage of scripture. I just want to point it out for those uh, that have not been a part of us so that they see this for themselves. All right. Here's what he says to the church. He says, seeing then that we have a great high priest, let's talk about Jesus specifically, the one who gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. That's why he's the high priest. So it seems then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. In other words, he rose from the dead, ascended to the heavens, as Acts chapter number one tells us. And it identifies him specifically. It says, Jesus, the son of God, let us what? Let us hold fast our profession. That's another way of saying, let us hold on to the confession we made before we were saved that we believe. 
that Jesus Christ is the son of God. God said, don't ever let go of that conviction in your mind. Don't ever go, let go of that faith because your confession is nothing but your faith verbalized. All right. Look what it says in verse uh, number 15. For we have not in high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, since he was made flesh like us, he knows the weakness of human flesh and how we can be tempted. But at the same time, he prevailed, he says, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet what? Yet without sin. I don't know about you, but I'm humble enough to say he could not have been talking about me. And hopefully you're humble enough to say in your own heart, he can't be talking about me either. Because obviously then, what are we lacking? We just talked about that. Something will hit you from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. If you're an honest person, as we have just said, but he says the consequence of this, the good part about this said, let us therefore, in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. It's talking about temptation. This is why prayer works. This is why prayer helps us uh, for the simple fact that Jesus will empathize with us and send us the strength to prevail if we're sincere about prevailing over that temptation that we're going through at that present time. All right, getting closer to finishing off here. So bear with me just a little bit longer um, as we continue uh, our story. And of course, again, we're applying this to us, not just an academic exercise. All right, so let's continue on again. We kind of went over this already that Jesus said that, well, we really did. Let me say it this way. The things which are impossible with men are imp are possible with God. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So why did God say that? Jesus said that in Luke 18, verse 27. Well, again, as we talked about earlier, the Jewish people were trying to earn their own salvation. Okay. And this is impossible for all mankind because, again, we all sin and need a savior. That's why our inspirations always come for, uh, excuse me, Romans 3, 23 and Romans 6, verse 23 that tell us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, this is the part I like about the scriptures, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So again, salvation at the end of the day is a gift to all of us. Does not eliminate our personal responsibilities to live as a disciple, to live righteous. It doesn't say that. That's not, not that's, that's, that's violates the Bible when we do that. But at the end of the day, even at our best, is what it's really saying, and it takes the blood of Christ to save our souls. So again, God testifies to this in another way. You look at 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2, for instance, where Jesus is saying that, I mean, the, the word of God is saying about Jesus, that Jesus is the propitiation for all of our sins. I'll let you find that one on your own time just to preserve some time. Propitiation in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2 can easily be translated as the atonement. In other words, that which brings peace with God for us. And notice again, it said Jesus is sinless, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. He has a high, he is the high priest, and that he is the atonement, which means a propitiation, the peacemaking offering between any Christian and God. Without him, there would be no peace with God. So again, as we're finding out, salvation is a gift. All the scriptures harmonize with each other. Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, and Ephesians 2, verse 8 and verse number 9 also harmonize with, with uh, what the scriptures are saying. And that's one thing I want to want to read that one for a minute. Because to me, that's one of the most humbling scriptures that one can encounter. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and verse number 9, to keep us from comparing ourselves uh, by others and also to keep us from spiritual arrogance as well. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9. Let's look at it for a minute. <clears throat> As some of the people like to say nowadays, some of the slang just keeps us from feeling ourselves, if you know what I mean. We don't get beside ourselves and think we're so righteous that we become odious to, to other people and to God himself. All right, let's look at this for a minute. Look what God says, and he's talking to the church now. Remember, this letter from Paul was God's word directed to Christians already. He says in verse 8 and verse number 9, he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Hmm? He didn't say your own personal perfection because nobody has that. 
He said, for by grace, meaning God's unmerited favor, favor shined upon us. Are you saved through faith? And that not of yourselves, it is what? He's talking about salvation. The grace that you receive, the salvation you receive is not of yourself. You didn't do that for yourself. It is the what? The gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, boasting means we don't have nothing to brag about. Even if we've been in the church 50 years, we still don't have nothing to brag about for ourselves. The only bragging that we need to do is on the blood of Christ that washed away all our sins. And is the only way we'll make it to heaven and have peace with God. That's what we brag about. That's what we praise. Not ourselves because we don't deserve it. Truth be told. All right, let's continue on then with this. All right. So again, God, Jesus is trying to show them something. He's trying to show them that you cannot earn your way into heaven with the story of the rich young ruler. All right. So he's saying what's impossible with man, he's talking about earning your way into heaven, um, is, is, is impossible with man. But salvation is still possible with God is probably my best way of explaining that to you. So here's uh, here's what we need to say. Uh, talk about this a little bit further. Luke chapter 18, verse number 28. Peter responded to this incident um, of the rich young ruler in Jesus' encounter. And he's basically saying in a nutshell, you can read it on your own time, that we have left all to follow you. He's talking about he and the 12. Now, Peter and apostles should be commended for leaving houses and occupations to follow Jesus. Not many people would have done that, especially in this day and age. And so these men should be commended uh, for the sacrifice they made in order to truly be uh, disciples of Jesus. And so that means what sacrifice are we making? You know, we talked about it earlier today. What sacrifice are we really making? We don't have to give up houses and, and, and families and occupations to follow Jesus. Um, but at the same time, our commitment should do the same thing. So again, looking at Romans 12, verse 1 and verse number two, uh, two for a moment. And again, another another very famous passage of scripture that Henry Street is used to. But for the sake of others, let's look at it just quickly for a minute. All right. Again, Paul is writing to the church. He says, I beseech you. That means I beg of you. I urge you. Therefore, brethren. By the mercies of God. In other words, because you have received the mercies of God, that you what? You present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's talking about total and complete devotion. And he's saying how do you, how to do it. He said, be holy. Be separate from the world. The way that you, you think, you act, you react, um, your word, thoughts, and deeds should be totally separate, totally different than the world world would do. And so, again, it makes you what? Acceptable to God, which is your what? Reasonable service. It's reasonable to offer God these things, these sacrifices, because Christ gave way more than we ever could give in this life. So it's reasonable for us to fall in line with his will by holy and acceptable living unto God. How do you do that? Verse 2 elaborates on that some. It says, and be not conformed to this world. Be unlike everybody else in this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a holy mindset. Let that take over. That ye may do what? Ye may prove. That means be able to discern, be able to decide between something. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, the closer and closer you get to God, the more word of his word that you know, the more things are going to stick out to you as unacceptable in this world. Perhaps many of you, you know, have been Christians a long time. You can look back even at your own life and just look at your own life, not anybody else's. And you might even say to yourself, how did I get caught up doing that? How did I live that lifestyle? You know, if I did these things today, I could even live with myself. I could even sleep at night because of the things I used to do. But see, a lot of the things we used to do, we did it in ignorance. We didn't really know the will of God what was acceptable and what was not acceptable unto him. We were just kind of like we like to say, going with the flow. We were doing what the world was doing. We were doing what our friends were doing. We were doing, what, if I can say it this way, some of the dysfunctional things we saw growing up even in our own families. But the more and more we got to know God, 
the more and more we started erasing these things out of our minds. We started changing the way that we think. We started changing the way we speak and the things that we do because God had been working on us, making us grow spiritually so much that now we can see evil everywhere. Hmm? Now we can see Satan's traps. And now we're wise enough and strong enough to get around the things that used to trap, trap us in years gone by. That's spiritual growth. That's something that we thank God for, that he's willing to work with us and be patient with us to get to these points in our lives. But again, you got to be committed and sincere about it in order for him to work with you. Again, that's part of the fruit of the spirit. Okay. Let me move on guys and ladies, because I only got about nine minutes and just a little bit more to go. And I appreciate your patience with me here today as we reason together with into the scriptures that is with the scriptures. All right. Now let's move on uh, to Luke 18, verse 29 and 30. He's talking about the Christian life here. Now, I guess we better look at that specific Luke 18, 28 and 29. So we don't get lost. Now, remember, when you interpret the Bible, you interpret in context what was said before and what was said after these words. So we don't miss uh, the message that's in this specific verse. All right. Here's what Jesus says. And he's talking about the here and now. He's talking about the Christian life in verse 29 and 30. He said, and he said unto them, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who should not receive manifold more in this present time. Now he's talking about the day in which he lived, not heaven. And in the world to come, life everlasting. That's the part he's talking about when it comes to heaven. So he's talking about two different phases of the Christian uh, existence in verse 30. He's talking about the here and now, and he's talking about the hereafter. All right, so let's break this down for a moment. What is he really talking about in context? All right, he's talking about following him. He's talking about being a Christian. This is part of the blessings of being a Christian. You can study in your own time, but Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, Mark chapter 10, verse 29, and verse number 30 adds on to a little bit more detail of what Jesus is actually saying. He's talking about what we give up for the kingdom of God will, re, re, will be replaced in life with more. He's talking about the blessings of a church family. You see, you have to realize something. In those days, oftentimes, that if somebody left the Jewish faith, and they became a Christian, they lost their mother, they lost their father, they lost their brothers and sisters. In other words, they became ostracized. It was, you know, because it wasn't popular to be a Christian in those days, okay? And so God is saying what you, you lose by following Jesus, God is going to replace it. And what he's talking about, in this case, if you lose your family after becoming a Christian, if they disown you, you have a big family to be a part of. It's called the Church of Christ. It's called the congregation. It's, it's called other Christians. They become your family. He's talking about places to stay when in need. He's saying, you know, especially in those days, being ostracized as a Jewish person that became a Christian, you might lose your home. You know, your father may kick you out. You know, your mother may kick you out. And he's saying somebody in so many words will take you in. You'll never be homeless and things of that nature because God is going to take care of those things through the Christian community. And those were the things that Jesus was uh, talking about. All right. So that's what it is. Don't don't be on TV and, you know, looking at TBN, CBN, Creflo Dollar and all of them kind of folks that would take this out of context. He's not talking about material things. As far as being rich on earth, he's talking about the spiritual things that you gain that are replaced, that may be taken away when you become a child of God, especially in the times in which the Jewish people lived. And it was dangerous, uh, unpopular to become a Christian child of God. Okay, I hope that makes sense to you there. Again, remember in context what he's talking about. Okay. All right. Now, Mark adds on to it, though. When you look at Mark 10, verse 29 and 30, he also tells us that you're going to have some persecution as a Christian now. He's not trying, as we like to say, uh, uh, 
sell your pie in the sky. He's saying that the, the Christian life is going to have some good times. It's going to have some bad times. We just talked about that, right? Of some of the possibilities for the Jewish people that converted to Christianity, some of the things that they went through. I mean, think about it. It got bad, especially in the first century, where especially if you look at Acts chapter number seven, look at Stephen just for preaching the gospel. He was killed. He was stoned by an angry mob. So Jesus is saying, you're not going to, it's not that you're not going to have any bad days. He's just going to help you get through it. That's what Paul was talking about. When you look at Philippians 4, 13, uh, 4 verse 13, the context of what Paul is talking about, the reason why he said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, because he said, I know how to live high and I know how to live low. I know what it is to have good times. I know what it is to have bad times. I know what it is to have to have everything I need. I know what it feels like to be in one at times. He's saying, but despite my circumstances, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. Okay. So again, think about this persecutions, but eternal life will also come. Now that's what one thing you have to realize in John chapter eight, verse 44, you can read on your own time. The devil also has some children. Oh, you probably didn't want to hear that, but he does have some children in this world. That's why I say in John 8, verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. He was addressing his, his, his enemies at that time. And so if God and Satan have, are, 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 should, let me say it this way. If God and Satan are locked into a spiritual battle, their children down here are going to be locked in the same battle. Okay. So that's why you run into some people that are jealous of you and you never done anything wrong to them. That's why you have people that hate you and they don't know you from the next person. It's because they they got the devil in them. Let's just say it the way it is. They're devil-inspired people. And so whenever they see good in you, they're going to attack some way, somehow. But again, Jesus still says what? Be faithful unto death, no matter what. Okay? Now, remember 1 John 4, verse number 4, when you need those encouragement, um, when you, especially when you're going through these adversaries in your life, uh, He, the Bible tells us that greater is he that's in you than, than he that's in the world. In other words, you got God in you. You can, you have somebody in you to get you through these things. You still have the Holy Spirit. Didn't we just talk about that? Galatians 5 or 22 and 23. That can produce joy in you no matter what that you're going through. You just got to submit to that joy. You got to submit to God's work in your life and don't keep looking at your circumstance, but look at God instead. And then you'll be out of the dumps. You'll be out of depression. You'll be out of frowns on your face all the time because you understand the battle is actually God's. And we are part of that. Now, remember, Christ will strengthen us to endure for our own salvation if we stay committed to him. Again, that's if you look at Philippians 2, 12 and verse number 13, that's why God tells you to work out your own salvation uh, with fear and trembling. He's not saying you can save yourself. He's saying live, live the best life that you can live and God will help you do the rest. That's the context of Philippians 2, verse 12 and verse number 13. And again, going down to Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. All right, last but not least, here is the reward of the Christian life. Revelation 21, verse number four, as we end here, where God tells us that in the heavenly glory, now remember Revelation 21 is talking about the everlasting. It's talking about the everlasting life and what it's going to be like. We don't have time to deal with the whole chapter. Revelation 21, verse number four, should get you through any bad day that you ever have. Uh, and God tells us the sweet promise that there'll be no more dying there. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain and there'll be no more sorrow. And the good part about all of this and that it, it is forever. May God bless you. May keep you. We're going to, we wrapped up this, um, this series on the rich young ruler. Hopefully it's been a blessing to you and um, you're getting closer to God by the knowledge and wisdom you're gaining from spending time in the word as you have uh, on these occasions. Keep it up, keep it up on a daily basis and you'll see that your life will change and it'll change for the better. Um, so again, eternal life will be sweet and worth it if you hang on to Jesus unto the end. Next week, if the good Lord sees fit and we're able to do it, we're going to start a new um, a study. And we're going to talk about, and again, it's, it's inspired by Luke chapter 18 as we continue down the chapter about Jesus foretelling his death. But we're going to do it in such a way in which it's going to be, I like to call it an adult level conversation on the sacrifice that Jesus made and just making us remember how much he loved us. So we're just going to follow the text. 
Our topics come directly out the Bible, out of Luke chapter number 18. So if you will, and as the uh, Bereans did in Acts chapter number 17, study behind me to see if these things are so. I'm never offended by that because that's your responsibility to make sure you're being taught the truth. And study ahead of me if you want. Uh, go to Luke chapter 18 so you have questions and things of that nature when we continue to uh, go through the scriptures. I believe you should be at Luke 18 verse 31. Uh, starting the next lesson. Yes, because we, the rich young ruler was Luke 18, 18 to 30. So we'll start at Luke 18, verse 31 on next occasion. Good Lord sees fit. May God bless you. May he keep you. Pray for me as I pray for you. God bless. Good night.